This talk that I'll take you through is on audit and governance. When we look at reflective medical practice, when we look at critical thinking, one thing we always have in mind is how to maximize and optimize the healthcare we deliver and how to minimize the risk to the patient and practice in a very transparent way aiming at looking at our performance, looking at our weaknesses, looking at our risk uh, minimization procedure, looking at root cause analysis of adverse events of problems we encounter in order to reflect on them and in order to improve them. And that's the essence of audit and governance. How can I improve my performance? And how can I minimize, by improving my performance, the risks to the patient? And how can I improve the quality of the care that I deliver to my patient? Improve safety and improve outcomes. One thing to, to take on board from the onset, when we look at medical practice and we reflect on our clinical practice is that human beings make mistakes because the systems, the tasks and processes they work in are poorly designed. Okay, so we will make mistakes in any walk of life and in any profession and in particular we'll see in the medical profession. So we have to accept that making mistakes is part of our practice. The more we identify the mistakes, the more we identify the risks linked to the mistakes we make, the more we can minimize them and the more we can improve our practice. And again, that is the essence of audit and that is the essence of clinical governance. Always to have this awareness in mind. Am I performing to the best of my ability? Are the system, the infrastructure, the processes around and available to me to perform to the best of my capacity and minimize the risk to the patient? So reflective thinking and clinical governance are closely linked. Clinical audit aims to improve clinical effectiveness. It is based on reflective thinking, research, development of processes, reading, informing ourselves and educating ourselves. It's also based on openness because we have to be open. We don't want to hide our mistakes. We don't want to brush our mistakes under the carpet and hide them. On the contrary, we want to highlight them. We want to be proud that we identify our own mistakes and our team mistakes in order to say, in a very transparent way, in an open way, we know our weaknesses, we can do better, we are addressing it to minimize risks to patient and improve outcome. Education and training is important. Clinical audit, clinic effect, clinical effectiveness root cause analysis of mistakes, research and development to develop new processes, new infrastructure, new protocol, new standard operating procedures, SOPs, all this in a culture of openness, lack of fear and embracing mistakes not as mistakes. I remember talking to somebody and saying, people learn from their mistakes. He said, no, people learn from their experience. So forget the word mistakes that has a negative undertone. We learn from our experience, we recognize it, we improve it. So clinical governance is making patients care safe, effective, and of the highest standard and being accountable to the public and to the patients for our clinical activities. So for that 
clinical staff need to lead on governance. First and foremost, as Hippocrates told us all those years ago, practice of medicine is primarily do no harm. First, do no harm. Primum non nocere. First, do no harm. Now I'll ask you, do you realize that doctors are more likely to kill patients than pilots? And do you realize that doctors are more likely to make fatal mistakes and mistakes in general compared to airline pilots? And why is that? First, we need to know that the risk of dying in a hospital as a result of a medical error is 33,000 times the risk of dying in an aeroplane. Why? Why are we so dangerous compared to what we perceive as a dangerous profession, flying aeroplanes? Doctors are more likely to kill than pilots because pilots have systems. Pilots have enforced rests. Pilots have protocol and system to follow. Pilots are supported by automated system that can override their own mistakes. And pilots, when they do things manually, they have to do everything in duplicate. And that's why when you fly to a conference, in the cockpit there is the pilot, but there is the co-pilot. So everything is double-checked. Everything is done in duplicate, according to checklists, according to protocols, according to uh, automated computerized procedures. They have systems. Therefore, the systems protect them and the passengers from errors and mistakes. In the medical profession, very often we operate without these systems and doctors are out there with their patient, with their clinical situation and challenges all on their own. And somebody said, if doctors died with their patient, as the pilot would if the plane crashed, there would be less medical error. But we walk away when the patient has died and go home in the safety of our home and leave the patient's family to grieve the loss of their relative. But the pilot doesn't have this luxury. If he crashes, he dies. So he has to be extra, extra careful. So how does audit and clinical governance matter to minimize and to improve our performance? Healthcare poses a significant risk to hospital patients in the developing world. Back to the analogy bit between a pilot and between a doctor. If you get on a plane in an emerging country, you're probably more likely to reach your destination than if you get in a hospital in a developing country. WHO studied 24 hospitals mainly across the Middle East, North Africa, the MENA region, and Sub-Saharan Africa and Yemen. In some of these countries, adverse events, in other words, mistakes and errors by the medical and nursing team, by the caring team, are the fifth commonest cause of death. So you have infection, you have trauma, you have accident, you may have dehydration, but the fifth major cause of death in some countries, hospitals, is medical errors. So this has to be addressed. And this is why clinical governance is important. It's improving patient safety. Through improving the quality of care we deliver to the highest standard. And also by the awareness that we should be accountable to public and patient. In some countries, this accountability is also legal, medical legal. So if you make a mistake, you're more likely to be sued, you're more likely to go to court, you're more likely to have your medical license withdrawn and your practice stopped. So again, you have as a doctor 
then a vested interest in avoiding this from happening, in improving your systems that support you, in improving the infrastructure within which you work, and we will see how. So clinical governance has many aspects, audit, risk management, information availability, clinical effectiveness, education and training, public and patient involvement. And as back to the loop we talked about before. So clinical governance is a generic term that encompasses clinical effectiveness, clinical audit, risk management, research and development of systems, open medical practice, OMP, and RCA, root cause analysis, all around the principle of reflective clinical practice and all around the principle that we are involved in today, which is of medical education and continuing medical education as well as training. So if we look at the reflective cycle of Gibbs that we went through in our reflective medical practice talk, all this revolve around how we handle a clinical situation, how we learn from our mistakes, how we develop systems and analysis to avoid their repetition and improve the patient's outcome. How can we improve patient safety? Through audit and clinical governance. We need to engage all medical and non-medical staff. We cannot act and work in isolation. If we work in isolation and not as a team, we increase the risks of medical error. If we work in isolation outside systems and without protocol and without SOP standard operating procedures, we will make mistakes. We need a clinical governance team who guide, monitor, encourage me of nurses, doctors, pharmacists and so on. They will lay some guidelines, put some protocols in place, put some structure so that their colleagues and themselves practice safe medicine. And also, it's important to encourage incident reporting. It's important to recognize, as we said before, that we are all making mistakes daily. Let's call them we're all gaining from our experiences daily. So it's important to highlight this experience. Encourage reporting of incidents, encourage reporting of adverse events, encourage reporting of drug-related side effects, encourage reporting of medical mistakes. And move away from the blame. So the first reaction to somebody who reports that he's given the wrong dose of insulin to a patient is not to blame him, is not to shout at him is to look at the cause, the root cause analysis. Why the system allowed him or her, be it a doctor, be it a medical student, be it a trainee, be it a nurse, to make such a mistake. Because before you blame him or her, you need to make sure that one, he or she has been educated to avoid this mistake, two, that there is a system of double checks that would have allowed to avoid this mistake. Three, that there was a protocol that he or she should have followed that would have avoided that mistake, and so on and so forth. So, basically, to avoid mistakes, you have to avoid the blame culture, you have to embrace mistakes as opportunities to grow and to learn. And you have to use mistakes to justify the presence of structures in place. Cl clinical protocol should be there on every ward. Active audit program should be initiated and up and running in every department. And this is some of the things you may want to do during the six months transplantation online course. 
check your procedures in the transplant world. Check your procedures and your activities and your protocols in your renal unit. And if there aren't any, ask why. Check when the mistakes have been reported. Check how the mistakes were reported. And check what happened to the one who undertook a mistake. And very often you'll find that the one who undertook a mistake was punished when he should have been embraced, trained, educated, and thanked for highlighting a deficiency in the system delivering the care within the unit he works because this would allow to address it and avoid further mistakes. Infrastructure dedicated to government and engage with all the hospital management and team. So I'll give you a clinical scenario. Your senior nurse tell you that over the last three months, 50% of patients on the dialysis unit have a hemoglobin of less than 9 gram per deciliter, which is way unsatisfactory, as most guidelines will say, that more than 80% should have a hemoglobin around 11 and 12 gram per deciliter. So obviously your system is not working. So, how would you investigate? What can you do? The first question is, is there a protocol for anemia management? Are the doctors on the dialysis unit aware of the protocol? Because you can have a protocol and it's hidden in a shelf and nobody's read it. So anybody who works in the unit should have read the protocol and preferably should read the protocol every few months and preferably should sign that he or she has read the protocol. Now the protocol may be there, it may have been read but it's not adhered to. So the audit manager or the unit manager, manager or the head of the unit should make sure that the protocols are adhered to. And then you look at the clinical characteristic of the patient. Are there reasons why they're not responding? Are they under dialysed? Are they infected? Are they inflamed? And then you put all this into consideration. You research the situation. You reflect on the situation. You go and read and explore the literature about percentage of anemia control in different dialysis units worldwide in your country, in your region, and then, based on the findings, you can change outcomes by closing the audit loop. So, problem is identified, standards are set, data is collected, and then we look, where is the problem? Maybe the patients are under dialysis. So, we identify the area for improvement. We review our dialysis prescription. We leave the new system in place, let's say for six months or a year, and we re-examine and re-analyze the data to see whether the changes in place have been implemented and have led to improved outcome. That is the audit cycle. You identify a problem, you try to analyze the underlying cause, you address the underlying cause, you follow the patient up for a new period, and you assess improvement and changes in practice and in changes and improvement in outcomes. So why audit? Improve patient's care and safety, encourage teamwork, put in place structures to minimize risk, and ultimately this will also be a better risk-benefit operation and a much more cost-effective operation because medical mistakes cost money and minimizing risk, minimizing medical errors will improve your unit cost-effectiveness and save money. There are problems with audit. Audit is not research. Audit is a form of data evaluation akin to research, but perhaps not always undertaken with the same precision, standards, and effectiveness of clinical research. Very often, audit 
is weak on statistics and statistical verification. Outcomes measures can be subjective, can be poorly documented. And again, this takes you back that everything that happens in your unit, whether it's a dialysis unit, whether it's a transplant unit, should be documented. You cannot have a mistake or a medical error and then go back and find that you can't find where the pharmacy was, you can't find where the insulin was stored, you can't find where the syringes were that allowed to draw twice the dose of insulin, you can't find who prescribed the dose, you can't find who signed the medication, who injected and so on. No, you need proper documentation. You also need protocols that are written, accessible, adhere to and regularly updated and you need to regularly review your procedures review your performances with a view to improve them what is root cause analysis is a form of audit where again when you have a incident how to investigate how to identify the contributing factor how to determine the root cause of the problem. And then, number seven, develop risk reduction, improve quality. Number eight, report an action plan. Nine, implement the plan. And then again, the loop, reevaluate effectiveness of new actions and reduction of related incidents and therefore better health care delivery. So in summary, all clinicians should work within a framework of clinical governance. A bit like reflective medical practice. I want you to get in the framework of a medical practice which is based around clinical governance. How to best deliver the care. How to best minimize the risk. Audit and risk management are essential part of medicine. Encourage, don't punish incident reporting and no blame culture. The minute you install a blame culture, people will not report, will not learn and will not avoid mistakes second time around. So in a way, by not reporting, you perpetuate and you possibly multiply the number of errors and medical mistakes. Teamwork and communication is mandatory and a culture of challenging practice and striving for improvement. So if we come to challenging practice, challenge authority, but justify your challenge by evidence. So if you look at the talk on evidence-based medicine, if you want to challenge, challenge it. Challenge the protocol, improve, but go and find the evidence. Go and read the papers, critically appraise the evidence, and then you have a ground to challenge authority. And ultimately, the question you want to ask yourself over and over again as a medical practitioner, how can I improve my patient's safety? Making the safety of patients, everyone in the team, highest priority. So the NHS has this philosophy of no avoidable death, no avoidable harm, eventually, through better clinical governance. And back to Hippocrates, premium, non no shame, first and foremost, as medical practitioner, do no harm. And one thing that will help you minimizing harm is good clinical governance. And we will ask you to write a 500-word essay on clinical governance based on that talk and based on your reading of the literature. Thank you for attention, your attention. That is the end of that talk. Thank you.